Um, so hello everybody, my name is uh, Suzanne Bechtet, I'm from McGill University in uh, Montreal, Canada, and I'm also a member of the uh, Centre de Recherche en Biologie Structurale. Um, thank you very much for inviting me to this meeting and letting me speak about um, what I believe um, is a very important topic in new degeneration and multiple systems atrophy, which is microtubules and the microtubule associated proteins. So let me dive straight in. Um, to microtubules. So what are microtubules? Microtubules are a very important component of the cytoskeleton. So in this very first image, you can see microtubules here in yellow in human cells in cell culture. And as you might imagine from these images is that they provide cell shape to cells, so general stability to cells. And importantly, they also serve as the train tracks for the transport by motor molecules. And I will have a slide later that explains that a little bit in detail. Microtubules also form mitotic spindle, which is the force generating apparatus um, that will divide chromosomes in cell division into two daughter cells. So it really makes these super integrated structures of mitotic spindles that provide um, quite a force in, in this process. For the talk today, what's important is that microtubules are the backbone of axon dendrites in neuronal cells, so neurons, but also in other cells in the brain. And here they're stained in magenta. And you can see how prominent this magenta staining is in these processes that will become the, the axons later on in this um, sort of young neuronal cell. And then microtubules are also um, the dominant structure that makes cilia in this beautiful nine plus two structure. So cilia you find in sperm cells, for example, or in respiratory uh, tract cells that will um, provide um, motility to, to the cells, for example. So microtubules, as the name suggests, are small tubes, um, and they're made out of this protein tubulin. In fact, they're made out of alpha and beta tubulin, and there are several genes in humans that code for alpha and beta tubulins. And then alpha beta tubulin come together, these dimers come together in this head to tail arrangement that will form these protofilaments. And about 13 of these protofilaments come together to form a hollow tube, as is suggested here in this electron micrograph in Celia. So microtubules are nothing but a hollow tube. Um, and those microtubules provide um, mechanical stability. As I've indicated here also, um, tubulin is a GTPA. So the incoming tubulin is in a GTP state, and only in the microtubule lattice will tubulin um, hydrolyze GTP into, into GDP. So there's also a business end for microtubules, which we generally refer to as the plus end, and that is the end um, that we will see is, is very dynamic in cells. So I've hinted at this one very important function of microtubules to be the train tracks in axons um, and dendrites and, and other cells. And so in this very first movie, what you can see is a piece of an axon and fluorescently labeled cargo vesicles um, that are being transported in both directions, as you can see here. So they're moving forward and they can also move backwards over large distances. And that happens as I start a second movie here by the action of motor proteins, in this case, kinesin. You can see here this kinesin molecule that is hauling this very large vesicle um, on these train tracks that are our microtubules. And as you can imagine, um, we need these train tracks to be relatively stable and present in those cells and in good integrity uh, for these transport processes to happen. So how is this important in multiple systems atrophy and other neurodegenerative um, diseases. So let's take a look at those two, two cell types that are relevant um, in these diseases. There's, there's more, obviously, um, but sort of the key players, which is oligodendrocytes, which are these beautiful integrated cells that form the myelin sheets around axons. And then also, obviously, um, new, neurons. Um, and so I'm depicting here just sort of my drawing of a neuron is. And what you should be noticing is two things in the beginning. Both of these cell types are highly, highly branched. So both neurons have this intricate um, upperization of dendrites, but then also very long axons. And then oligodendrocytes are these very highly branched cells um, with multiple, multiple processes. And the backbone of these cells are microtubules, which I've tried to depict here in green um, in both of these cells. And all processes are shock full of these microtubules. 
Oligodendrocytes um, can myelinate up to 50 axons, just illustrating how many of these processes um, these cells have and um, what kind of distances these likely need to span. And then for um, dopaminergic neurons, there's this very impressive number, which is that a single dopaminergic neuron, um, the length of all their um, axons dendrites will sum up to 4.5 meters. And you can imagine that these cells have a large log logistic problem trying to move cargo along these train tracks, along these microtubules throughout the entire length in a very efficient and very regulated um, way. To highlight um, the importance and abundance also of microtubules in the brain is that about 20% of the dry protein mass in the brain, so if we, if we isolate the proteins, um, would be tubulin, the building block of microtubules. So it is really um, a dominant um, feature in, in brain cells. And so all of this is to say that potentially small perturbations in the stability and also dynamics of these train tracks, of these microtubules, might have a devastating effect on, on these cells and uh, might promote degenerative processes. Um, and that is shown in this fact that early signs of neuronal degeneration include deep stabilization and the loss of microtubules in um, all kinds of diseases that have been uh, that have been studied. So I'm going to make your life now a little more complicated by um, also telling you how dynamic this microtubule cytoskeleton is. So it's not just very stable and and very steady, providing stability and providing train tracks, but it's also highly dynamic. And what we use in the lab to study these dynamics is this molecule called end binding protein. That's nothing but a protein um, that likes to serve the tip of a growing microtuber. And we usually um, include a fluorescent marker in this, in this molecule so we can see it under the, uh, under the light microscope. And this is how this generally looks like. So here's a human interface cell that we study um, in the lab. And you can see these comets, sort of these signals um, from these growing microtubules emanating from the center of the cell. It's called the centrosome. That's a microtubule organizing center. And you can see how many microtubules are being made um, in these cells. This movie is running for only two minutes. So we've observed the cell for only two minutes. And you can see how many microtubules are being made in that time frame. What you can see is that an equal number of microtubules are falling apart at the uh, about the same time frame to keep an equal number of microtubules in those cells. And just to show you that this is not um, a trick that we that we used to see um, interface cells. Here is an oligodendrocyte in um, under the microscope that has equally as equally expressing this end binding protein, and you can see how many of these comets, these EB markers of growing microtubules you can see um, in just uh, a couple of minutes in these cells as well. And this is a red oligodendrocyte, um, and this is worked by uh, Mang Mang Fu uh, from a cell paper in 2019. So that's to say that the half-life of microtubules has been estimated to be um, seconds to a couple of minutes in specialized cell types like these um, neuronal um, cell types. So we have a large amount of dynamics in these cells. And as you might be able to imagine, is that none of this can happen just randomly in cells. Cells really need to control when microtubules are being made, how many are being made, how fast they are growing, and when they're falling apart. And all of this is being mediated by microtubule-associated proteins, which is a heterogeneous class of proteins. And here's a couple of them depicted. So here is um, maps that help nucleation of microtubules. So this first, very first step of bringing the first tubulin dimers together to form a nucleus. And then this nucleus has to grow into a proper microtubule. So there's maps that control that too, how fast they're growing. And then we have maps that control when, where, and how quickly these microtubules are falling apart as well. And there's more than 100 different uh, maps in cells that control all these different aspects under different cellular um, situations. So one of the maps um, I would like to discuss today is the tubulin polymerization promoting protein, or called the PPP. And together with uh, Meng Meng Fu here, when she was a postdoc at uh, Stanford, we had this very nice collaborative work where um, Meng Meng had discovered um, that the PPP is important in uh, microtubule dynamics in oligodendrocytes. So again, we are looking at our little oligodendrocytes myelinating axons. Here is that same movie I've shown you before. 
And I would like to highlight that in addition to microtubules emanating from the cell body, we do see microtubules emanating from these branch points in uh, these extensions of these uh, oligodendrocytes. And Meng Meng found that in this branch point, we find pieces of the Golgi apparatus called Golgi outposts that are nucleating microtubules at those branch points. And with the help of knock-on mice, um, she also discerned that um, the PPP, this tubulin polymerization promoting protein, is involved in the nucleation process in the, at the Golgi outposts. So that was um, um, a paper in 2019. So now you might be wondering what has the PPP to do with multiple systems atrophy? And here's very early work uh, from 20, uh, 2007. Um, where people found that TPPP relocalizes in uh, multiple, multiple systems atrophy from the myelin sheets, where it usually is at this, at this branch, but at these extensions of the oligodendrocytes to the cell bodies. So here's um, antibody staining for this TPPP in green and a myelin marker MVP in red. And you can see they're mostly co-localized because TPPP is in those um, myelinating branches, and then in MSA, it will be localized to um, these, so, uh, these the cell bodies, um, in fact. So that was a very early sign, and that has been known for, for quite some time. And Meng Meng, in um, her own lab, first at the NIH and now in Berkeley, is studying this kind of uh, phenomena in more detail. So what you can see here is data by Hunter Richardson in, in Meng Meng's lab, where Hunter has been staining control brains for TPPP and a nuclear marker called DAPI. And um, you can see there's barely any significant TPPP staining in cell bodies. And once we look in brains of MSA patients, um, that picture changes. So there's a lot of aggregates in the, in the cell bodies of those um, of those patient brains. And you can see this here quantified. So how many aggregates are being formed? And there's very few found in regular brains and control brains. And then there is a large amount of them found in brains from MSA patients. So then looking a little closer into this is that the aggregations are found both in the cell body as much as in these processes, in these myelinating um, uh, process in myelin sheets. And that is shown by co-localization with this um, line sheet marker MVP that is sort of merged here. So what we can conclude from there that um, these TPP aggregates are found um, in brains without perinuclear aggregates. So you can find them um, only aggregating in, in these myelin sheets. And from that, um, we kind of conclude that the PPP aggregation begins in the myelin sheet very, very likely and then um, propagates to the cell body as much as you can draw conclusions from these um, single time frames. And the other question that we thought was interesting is how this relates to the um, aggregation of alpha synuclein, which is a major um, player potentially in MSA, certainly in Parkinson's disease that is found also aggregated in, uh, in cells in aging brains, particularly in uh, in brains with, um, with Parkinson and MSA. And was Hunter found when, when she was staining for alpha synuclein and TPP together is that there's a few cells marked here, for example, that show aggregation of both of these proteins. And then there's a couple of cells here shown in this corner where we only find TPP aggregation and no alpha synuclein aggregation. And the quantification here shows that the majority of cells show only TPP aggregation there's very few cells that show both and very few cells that show only alpha synuclein um, aggregation. And we are concluding from there that very, very likely TPPP aggregation um, precedes alpha synuclein aggregation um, in these cells. So my lab is um, studying microtubules and microtubule associated proteins in vitro, which means we very often don't look um, in cells, but we purify these proteins in, um, and then look at them um, sort of ex vivo. And so what I'm showing here is a protein gel that we have purified um, TPPP 
here and we've purified TPP with a GFP tag. So this has a green fluorescent tag attached to it. That's why it's larger. And here is one of our test tubes. So you can see really TPPP is this nicely behaved soluble protein that sits in our test tube that we can now study. Um, that's obviously being the GFP version of it, green fluorescent version. And here's how we imagine this molecule to look like, um, this protein to look like. And what our lab is trying to understand now is how we can get from something that is so well behaved and so soluble to something that is forming aggregates in, in MSA. One thing to note about this protein is that even if you don't understand how protein structure works, is that there's a lot of these spaghetti structures. We call this disordered protein structures. Um, they appear a lot in proteins and they um, and what they confer to proteins is um, usually an effect um, that we call condensation that I will talk about in, in the next slide. But just to keep in mind, it's a highly disordered um, protein. And obviously, we are trying to discern this question, how this protein is likely to aggregate. So what we do in the lab is a lot of uh, microscopy with these in vitro purified um, molecules. And the way this assay looks like is we usually have a cover glass. We have our protein of interest, in this case, TPPP. And my lab often studies these molecules in conjunction with tubulin and microtubules to see how they interact. So very early on, one of these experiments um, showed us that TPPP formed these clusters, which we didn't like in the beginning because clusters are very hard to control for us. And then remarkably from these clusters, we get a lot of nucleation of the PPP, which is one of the many pieces of data that make us think that um, TPP is a good microtubule nucleator. Remarkably, all of this happens in the absence of so-called crowding agents. Um, so we get these clusters at low concentration, physiological concentrations, and in the absence of crowding agents, um, really highlighting how much this molecule likes to self-interact. Um, and one of the other readouts for self-interaction is this formation of these condensates. So these are droplets of our protein TPPP in solution that we can, again, observe under a microscope. And what you can see here that within um, two seconds, two of these droplets will not just kiss, they will also fuse. And that is a, um, a sign of these droplets having liquid-like properties. And maybe to help you um, imagine this a little more, um, this is sort of equivalent to what you can observe when you have uh, vinegar in oil or oil and vinegar. So there's two separate liquid phases that do not mix and that form um, these droplets and proteins can, can do that too when they are, when they self interact. So we've studied this phenomena a little um, more in detail and here's um, just a few of these data. What we found interesting is that these TPP droplets can we call tubulin? So here is uh, tubulin, TPPP, and they're co-localized in these droplets. So tubulin by itself will not show this um, condensate behavior. And then interesting enough, um, we can also recruit alpha synuclein into these droplets. Again, alpha synuclein um, has a little bit of a harder time um, forming these condensates um, by itself. And what we think this condensate um, behavior might be involved in is the physiological function of TPPP. So it might help actually recruit large amounts of tubulin and helping tubulin nucleation. And we can see that when we are adding um, GTP into this assay. So the moment we add GTP to help these um, molecules assemble, um, we can see nucleation of new microtubules from these droplets. And we have also added um, actually this end binding protein just to help visualize um, this process. So we can get a large amount of nucleation. And then for the situation with alpha synuclein um, recruitment, we think that enhancing the concentration of TPPP itself, but potentially with other players, with, for example, alpha synuclein, might enhance this aggregation phenomena of either one of those uh, of these proteins, um, maybe because of a concentration effect, maybe because they interact with one another. So another really interesting um, observation we had is that after about one hour, these TPPP droplets or condensates, they start hardening. We also call this coarsening. You can also imagine this as a little bit of an aging process. And here you can see a couple of droplets that have been together for um, a minute and they won't fuse anymore because they have changed their, their properties, their material properties, and they won't change anymore. Um, sort of indicating that there is biochemical um, changes to those droplets that are happening. 
in more interesting maybe than this sort of causing phenomena is that when we mechanically agitate this protein as it's being done with alpha nuclein when alpha nuclein is forming fibrils we can also form um, these TPPP fibrils here and also um, sort of protein sheet like aggregates and these sort of other um, types of aggregates so we find uh, mostly fibrils and sheets in these aggregates mechanically um, stimulated aggregates and then Andre from Mang Mang's lab has performed electron microscopy on some of these fibrils, really showing that we are dealing with these fibrillar structures of TPPP um, in, in these aggregated um, situations um, in vitro, that is. So why is this so remarkable that we form fibrils? Well, fibrils are a hallmark of many different um, sort of neurodegenerative diseases, Alzheimer's and Parkinson's, um, for example. And in Parkinson's, we find these fibrils of tau, um, these large tau aggregates um, that will likely also form these neurofibrillary tangles. So here's an electron micrograph of tau fibrils. By the way, tau is also a microtubule associated protein. And then also alpha synuclein has been shown to form these fibrils that are likely um, forming these, these Lewy bodies, or at least um, uh, in part forming these, uh, these Lewy bodies. And obviously, there's a lot more research being needed, what these aggregate formations mean and, um, and how bad they are and whether they're disease causing, but they're certainly associated with the observation of, of neurodegenerative diseases in, in general. So another really interesting observation that um, the Fu lab has made is that when we add these fibrils that we have made in vitro, to cell cultures of oligodendrocytes, it turns out that it's being toxic to oligodendrocytes. So here's a control field of you, where there's a happy oligodendrocyte. And then once TPPP fibrils and aggregates have been added to this culture, as we can observe in this tunnel assay, so it's an apoptosis assay, we can observe these um, black staining. So they're positive for tunnels, they're positive for being apoptotic, they are um, about to die. And it's being quantified that in the presence of TPPP aggregates and fibrils, um, this is enhanced in these oligodendrocytes. So they really don't like um, fibrils. So there's a lot more research obviously being needed, but I thought I'm going to summarize um, a little bit the, the way we are thinking right now about microtubules, microtubule associated proteins, and neurodegeneration in broad strokes. So in a happy oligodendrocyte or happy neuron, we have microtubules that are being regulated by these microtubule associated proteins. And in certain situations, MAPs like TPPP can condensate and aggregate clearly. And these aggregates, as we've shown in the uh, previous slide, can be toxic to oligodendrocyte, can be toxic to cells. So that might lead to cell death, neurogen neurodegeneration in general. But I would also highlight that the absence of microtubule associated proteins like TP, if they're aggregated, will now, so this protein will be missing from microtubules and that also might have detrimental um, consequences in, in this loss of microtubules and this degeneration of these train tracks in these cells that are so important and that cannot, um, that cannot be missing from these cells because that will enhance um, or lead to um, cell, cellular degenerative processes as depicted here. The other thing I would like to highlight in this talk is that if stability of microtubules is an issue in these cells, well, then we almost already have the cure at hand. And that is in form of microtubule stabilizing drugs. Um, I'm showing here Taxil, because microtubule stabilizing drugs have been extensively used in cancer treatment um, in high, high doses to basically freeze microtubule cytoskeletons in, in fast dividing cells, so tumors. And um, there has been this idea around that microtubule um, stabilizing drugs like Taxol or Apothelon D here can help prevent these degenerative processes that um, affect microtubule stability in cells. And indeed, that has been shown by many labs in so far only in rodent models, so in, in mice or rats that in models of Alzheimer's, the um, low doses of these molecules, low doses of apothelon D can reduce axonal dystrophy. Um, there's less tau tangles, importantly, improve cognitive performance of these animals. In spinal cord injury, um, it reduced scarring, um, helped in the regrowth of injured axons and improved walking in these animals. And then also in stroke models, it alleviated the injury and facilitated 
motor recovery. So importantly, there's not just um, sort of molecular events, cellular events that um, can be rescued, but the actual symptoms these animals displayed have been alleviated and the presence of low doses of a and that is um, research done by many um, colleagues um, in in this world. So I think there is a beacon of hope here that maybe this could be a, a path forward um, into treatment of these neurodegenerative um, diseases and a lot more research has been done to to do that. So having um, said that, I would like to conclude by um, thanking all the, the people who have been working on, on this research, which is um, in my lab, um, mostly Thomas, Leah, and, and Tanya, and um, obviously the, the full lab in, at the NIH and now in Berkeley, um, where a postdoc, um, Shanas, um, has been um, really leading this research um, with the help of Hunter and, and Andre. Obviously, it's thanking funding organizations and particularly um, the Feed MSA um, for helping my lab to fund some of this initial research and the exciting to uh, keep pushing on that. And uh, with that, uh, thanks everybody for coming to this conference and listening. Thank you.